Hi, welcome to Coffee and Poets. Uh, we are here at Naked Lounge on July 20th, 2014. I'm Bob Stanley, and I'm here with poet Susan Kelly DeWitt, and we're going to be chatting about her poetry, her ideas about poetry, um, why she writes, what she writes, and actually a little bit about her uh, teaching. She works with many poets here in Sacramento and has a lot of people, you might even call followers, who, who <laughs> respect her greatly, but I don't want to embarrass her. Um, I'm actually filling in for Tim Call today. Uh, Tim was scheduled to, uh, to interview Susan, and he selected her. Certainly a great choice, and uh, Tim's in the hospital. We're hoping he uh, recovers quickly. Um, it's a, a kind of a heart issue, and so we're hoping they figure out what the heck that is and get Tim uh, back in action with all of us. He's a, a big part of our poetry community. But uh, I'm honored to be uh, filling in and chatting with Susan about, uh, about her work. I've been a fan of her work. I've, I have two of her books at home, the, the Fortunate Islands, which is a beautiful book that came out in 2007, and uh, Cassiopeia Above the Banyan Tree, which I think I'm lucky to have because I think it might be out of print. It's a, a chapbook that came out also in 2007. Um, and Susan, you've been... Uh, writing poetry a, a good part of your life. Uh, maybe just some thoughts, uh, why you write, uh, what, what you like about poetry, what draws you to it? Um, well, actually, I started writing a little later than um, many people. I was in my mid-20s. Um, and uh, even though I did write a thing or two uh, when I was in high school, um, and... Um, what, in fact, when I teach poets in the, used to teach poets in the schools, I like to, to tell the kids that I once wrote a very long, after reading Tale of Two Cities, I wrote like a two and a half page rhymed uh, poem. Uh, uh, and uh, it was all about somebody going to the guillotine. And the, the last <laughs> two lines were, so spoke my head from its place unseen where I left it near the guillotine. <laughs> And it was so bad. Um, but it, so fortunately, I didn't, uh, you know, keep writing uh, very much after that. But anyway, it was actually at Sac State that um, I uh, met um, Professor Bazanella, who encouraged me. Uh, Dennis and Catherine encouraged me. And um, that's where I really started uh, seriously writing. Uh, and, uh, you know, my... I, my I read a lot as a child. I read a lot of poetry in school, um, but not, like I didn't even know Sylvia Plath existed until I was older, you know. Uh, so it was a canon in those days. Um, and uh, my parents in Hawaii uh, were friends with a poet named Don Blanding. And um, I think as a very small child, hearing that he he came to our house a couple of times and hearing the sort of you know buzz around him and his visit and his work and so forth probably was in my mind somewhere and my parents were also uh, admired poets even though they they didn't have an education themselves um, anyway that's I don't know if that that's great um, then when you mentioned Dennis and Catherine Dennis Schmitz Catherine Holvine yes exactly. Um, Anything, I know Dennis is, is certainly, Dennis I think is a mentor to many here in Sacramento um, of our generation, and I think you to some degree right. have filled that role for the next generation. Is there anything that you, that you gleaned from Dennis or something that just pops into your head every once in a while? Put your nickel in the slot machine. <laughs> <laughs> That was we, Dennis. We, we can end the interview on that. <laughs> the other thing that Dennis told me was think of your poems when they go out to magazines as a halfway house. The magazine is a halfway house. And that you can always, you know, you, you can always change it again uh, if it goes into a book or something. And I think that was good advice for me anyway because I tend to revise and revise and revise and revise. And sometimes I make it worse. Uh, you know, so um, having a little distance. Uh, but Dennis was uh, Dennis was great. He was a great mentor. Um, yeah. That the the point of, your point about revision brings up one of the questions that Tim uh, gave me, and he was going to ask about 
um, do you what what is it you revise for? And he mentioned clarity, sound, diction, or emotional power. Uh, what are some of the things when you're revising? What is it you're going for? All of that. You know, uh, I think certainly clarity, uh, the best word in the words in the best order, um, as someone once said, uh, a sort of certain, depending on the poem, a certain tautness to the line. Tautness, okay. Tautness. Yeah. And, um, you know, just try to push beyond where I am at one moment, seeing if I can do that, either with just one word, finding a better word, uh, or sometimes, uh, you know, pushing deeper to see if I can go further with the thoughts of the poem itself. Um, but I think it's a whole, you know, the, the poem is a unit. It all work, has to work together. Um, so you're always looking at everything, I think, when you're revising. I love that pushing deeper, going further with the thoughts. I think you, you do that with your students, too. You kind of, kind of ask them to go deeper and to look farther into their own ideas. What is it you want to say? Um, and to kind of challenge them. Any, any thoughts on how you do that? Or? Well, in the recent workshop, uh, which was reading poetry and translation and, um, and just sort of thinking through the, pro uh, the translation process, I, I gave an exercise that was a homophonic translation. So they took a poem that they, in a language, written in a language that they didn't know, and they couldn't look at any translations of it. Um, and uh, one of the workshop people is in the audience. I hope I'm getting this right. I hope I'm remembering it correctly. Mr. Zumbio. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so, and then they had to translate this poem in a different language by sound alone, without knowing what the language sounded like. So how they, however they read it, sounded it out and come up with words in English that match those sounds. And I think everyone found it to be an interesting uh, exercise because it really put you in a completely different place. Uh, you had to, and, and people came up with such interesting things. And I think, you know, if you can translate what I'm saying into an answer for your question, and that that is one way of illustrating how one can push oneself into new territory. Uh, I think as poets, we're, we're looking for new territory. Um, and, uh, and it's not always easy to go there. <laughs> um, so however you can sort of shake yourself up, and so having to translate by sound alone, you know, you, you have to let go of everything that you know in a way of what poetry is and come up with something. And it was just really interesting to see what people did come up with anyway. That sounds great, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, maybe we could hear a poem. What do you, did you bring any to read, or do you have any anything come to mind? I've got a few, but I'd kind of yeah, like to hear well, it in your voice first. Well, Bob Stanley, some, a few people heard me say that I put my books in my backpack, and then I went in to check for my glasses, and I must have taken my books out. So that happens to you when you get a little older sometimes. <laughs> a, a poet without a poem to read. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, let me. Um, well, I have a poem coming out in an anthology called. Uh, what is it called? Winged, I think, and it's going to be an anthology of poems about bees, uh, and uh, so uh, I'd like to read the one that's going to be in there called Migraine, because this is a little bit outside the box. This is this poem, Migraine. The soul exists, but it is smaller than we think. Particles of scattered light fused to the size of a bee. I know this because I saw the soul last night. Soul, I said, it's you. And it drew near, and it hovered like a worker, and it changed colors, rose to violet to yellow, as if to signal, yes. I felt heat and stillness, something electric, from a swollen vein at the center of my being, and an inner eye bled open. Mm. Wow. What's that called again? 
Migraine. Migraine. Yeah. So that kind of opens up the door of, you know, the idea of poetry as spiritual practice or not spiritual practice, you know, religious experience. Is that when you write, um, and maybe I'm misinterpreting the poem because I just heard it for the first time, and the title is Migraine, but then the the content is right. beauty in a way. And the poem I was going to read kind of does the same thing, that even though you're describing something painful, you're describing it in a way that is a celebration of celebration of life in a way or, or of the mm. of the the knowing or the understanding something deeply. I hope so, Bob. You know, I, I don't really know. I think poets, I think as poets, we're the last people to know. We, we think we're doing something, we try. Uh, you know, it's kind of like being, if you've read the lives of, you know, great painters, they'll often say the, the, they don't they don't know it's interesting to them to hear what people say about the paintings in a show because they're the last ones to know. Um, and um, I, I think that's, uh, that's true for all of us, and I think it's definitely true for me. That certainly comes out of, uh, you know, I was a very um, uh, mm, religious, in quotes, well, not even in quotes, as a young person, uh, and um, I was, have definitely given a lot of thought to what a good life and, you know, spiritual, not in the or- orthodox or organized religious sense, but um, life is. And um, and I, as a young a- adult, I had some very interesting experiences that that poem draws from. I don't know what they were exactly, but they were sort of mystical experiences. I was reading a lot of mysticism and mystical writings at that point. So, um, so yes, it's definitely spiritual. I hope it in, in its own way. And um, I hope it's taking tough stuff and making something both useful and in some way beautiful out of it. But I'll take your word for it. <laughs> well, that's just, that's just how it struck me. I'm not sure about the other folks in the room. Can I here, take but, your word for it? Well, well, well it, it kind of raises another question, too. Do you write, do you write poems and you... You, you feel like they're finished and you're happy with them, but you're not sure what they mean? Yes. Uh, and in, interestingly enough, um, I have a number of things coming out or that have come out recently that are, uh, some of them are 30 years old and some of them are 20 years old. Uh, and uh, for Mr. Zumbiel, I practice what I preach sometimes. <laughs> um, but the, the interesting thing, I think for us all is, and I try to, you know, tell that to the people who are in my workshop, the poets in my workshop, because you you don't always know, and um, and so it's taken me some of these things. It's taken me thirty years. I maybe sent it out once, it came back rejected. I never sent it anywhere again, or some of them I just never sent anywhere. And I finally, you know, I'm looking at some of these older things, and I'm I see them, and I say, hmm. Gee, you know, and so I try it, and some people have um, have agreed that it actually does work after all. So, and I guess ambiguity is kind of what we're dealing with to some degree too. We Absolutely. don't want to be too. It's not a, Absolutely. a, you know, it's not an essay. It's not a clear argument. It's kind right. of a, a diffuse argument. Um, this brings up another one of Tim's questions: is um, that some poets would say that writing poetry is is a kind of activism that it should be that it is and should be a political act and others might say that the writing of poems is not sufficient political engagement what's your feeling about you know trying to make a change in the world with your poems well i don't think there are any either ors um i think you know it's i've always felt that uh poetry uh, at least for me, is intended as an act of giving form to uh, experience of... Um, I came from a line of women in my family who were denied educations, uh, who were never allowed really to speak, and uh, and many of the men the same way uh, due to, you know, the context around them. Uh, so I always felt that speaking out was um, an action for for the for the balance of 
you know, good and evil such as it is. Um, you know, whether you write, it, it depends. I've written political poems. Are they my best poems? No, but I had to write them. Um, but I do think that um, in this country, because we can uh, be on the Poets Against the War site with our poems, and nobody comes in and breaks into our house, drags us out, and shoots us in the front yard. We're not, we don't have to put our lives on the line here, as do many people around the world, in order to write poetry. I, ne I try never to forget that. Um, and um, uh, so uh, my feeling is you find your own, uh, your own formula. Uh, for me, activism, uh, I see poetry as activism, sometimes overtly, sometimes just by writing something that captures some beauty and uh, you know in our temporal world and hopefully weighs a little tiny fraction of a fraction against all these horrific things that are going on and then you know in your life you you have to do what you can when you can and that's different for everybody Whitman was one thing and Dickinson was another they were both great poets uh, so anyway yeah I know uh You've worked with uh, with the Women's Wisdom Project too. You did a lot of writing or uh, teaching writing there. And another thing that comes to mind is that you uh, assigned. I was in one of your classes when you assigned that uh, translation of the inter the book of international poetry, Ilya Kaminsky's oh, collection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so mm -hmm. it was amazing to me yeah. reading poems from right. I don't know Serbia, Japan, right. you know, throughout history, and how many of these poems were political poems you know, against right. atrocities that were going on all over the world. Right. And, you know, 25 different countries. Right. So that was, that was kind of amazing. And so I get the feeling you've kind of studied that, and that's a, that's a theme that runs through, through your own writing to some degree. Well, you know, I'm the daughter of uh, someone who fought in World War II and who was, you know, wounded physically and spiritually by that. Uh, lived through the Vietnam War and uh, saw my generation, things that happened. Um, and certainly reading, I mean, you know, if you read history, you, you're, as poets, we have to be interested in history. So you're reading history, you know these things are going on, you do what you can he, here, you know. Um, and yes, definitely reading, you know, reading the Russian poets. I once read uh, Nadezhda Mandelstam's uh, Hope Against Hope and Hope Abandoned, which are big books about uh, what happened there during the Stalin era. And, um, of course, her husband, Osip Mandelstam, was killed uh, or died in, in a uh, prison camp. Um, and, you know, they couldn't even trust their next-door neighbor. They had to be so careful. Uh, and that's... Uh, that's how I believe uh, Osip uh, went, t was taken to the prison camp. They, uh, if I remember, it's been a while. They read, uh, they were reading poems in their apartment, and and he had, a, you know, called uh, Stalin the peasant slayer, in the poem, and somebody reported that. Uh, so you know, the, the the fact that some people can't even breathe without the worry that that's going to take them somewhere. Uh, you know, perilous, and um, and you do get that when you read poetry from around the world, uh, and also I think it makes us realize that we're a global village. Really, we're. I love the fact that we're getting so much poetry now in translation because um, you you you're in touch with, you know, the the heart of the world, not just the heart of our country. Um, so anyway. I don't know if that's very articulate, but... Well, no, that, that's a good point. That actually leads me to another one of Tim's questions, um, which, which has to do with American society. Do you think there's enough going on? Are there enough readers and writers engaging with, with poetry here? Uh, and if not, what should poetry do? Should poetry become more like, uh, I don't know, uh, Marvel Comics? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're voting in the yeah. audience. <laughs> um, well, I I, uh, I I looked at the the NEA NEA did a some sort of study recently that said that only twelve percent of the American population 
uh, reads poetry. Um, and then the Poetry Foundation did another study, though, based, but it was the, the basis was different. They, I think, um, looked at people who read for pleasure, and the so among the pleasure reading for pleasure public, uh, there was a much larger segment of the, that population that read poetry. Um, I, I, you know, I think. Um, well, it's interesting. In, in a lot of countries, uh, many more of the people do read poems. Uh, and they, they, uh, they know who their poets are. Um, and, uh, and maybe that's because, again, there's more uh, at stake, you know, uh, historically and, um, and right in the moment. Um, I think uh, there's a story about Neruda, and I, I tell it every so often. I probably change it a little bit each time, so it might be a little apocryphal, but there was a point at which he gave a reading, and, um, and it was a huge hundreds and hundreds of people in the audience, and somebody asked him to read a poem that he hadn't been prepared to read, and he, he didn't know it from memory, and he didn't bring it with him. And the entire, almost the entire audience stood up and recited it to Neruda. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so we're waiting for that in our, in our careers. <laughs> but, but, you know, I like to think, and at least my way of thinking about it is that you never know when someone's going to read your poem. Once, this is long ago when I hadn't really even published very much, but for some reason a copy of The Poet News was, on, in the old days, was on a train in Kansas somewhere and someone read, found it on the seat and read my poem, yeah. no kidding, and uh, got in touch with me. Um, you never know, that's the thing that's wonderful about poetry is it goes out into the world. You never know who's going to read it and, and if it's going to change them. Um, you know, uh, and I like to think that even if just one thing uh, after I'm gone, if there's just one thing that somebody is either reads and finds, you know, connects with and finds useful or is walking down the street one morning and recites it to themselves from memory, I won't have lived in vain. Uh, I, I love that idea of you don't know where the poem is going to go. And, you know, you just trust and hope. You tr try to do your work, and you trust and hope that even if it's on a very small scale, the poem, the poems may do some work for other people. And... Um, so that's not exactly the same thing as, you know, what goes on in countries where there's oppression and so forth. But in, in our society, at least, that's how I, I, what I hope for myself and how I see it. Uh, Just to touch others. Yeah. Um, beauty and use. Yeah. We're talking with Susan Kelly DeWitt here at Coffee and Poets on July 20th at Naked Lounge. Our, our producer today is uh, Lawrence Dinkins, who's over there um, making sure that we're close enough to the microphone. And uh, so, so we've talked a little bit about political poetry. Another theme in your poetry that I've found is, is nature, right? You have one whole book that's about, I think, insects, right? I do. <laughs> and, that's, and that's an amazing book, kind of a handmade book. But... So I was just opened up the Fortunate Islands this afternoon before I came over, and I came across a couple poems that, that were nature poems. And, and I think that they, they were interesting, and they, they touched me in that way you were talking about kind of feeling like... Um, well, maybe I better read the poem first, and then we can talk about it. I don't, I don't want to preface things. So I'm going to read um, two, actually, back to back. And then I'd just kind of be interested in thoughts, and then I'll have questions about lines. The first one is called June Night. Mm. The moon dipping its fingers in ink. Darkness sucking a star's hot thumb. The sentience at the heart of the universe seems palpable. A storm of gardenias rocking and moaning a white rose's perfumed croon of snow. 
the murmur, murmur, murmur of alyssum, honey sweet, as though night had been given over to a crowd of wild girls camped out on humid bedrolls of jasmine. It's kind of a humid summer night here in Sacramento, so that one touched me. And then this is Inventing Anna. This morning's Anna's hummingbird lights the pollen wicks, the burnt orange lanterns of Chinese maple, as another day begins in the short series called June, July, and August, and each blossom shakes out the night's wet mix of stars and dark. It is then that I imagine a taciturn settler's lonely child wife falling into flattery or love with the itinerant naturalist who named this handful of darting plush. After that first heated blush of arousal at the girl's throat, then picked up again for the East an anonymity. Yes, my Anna will be lost to oblivion and childbed fever three years later. But the lover striking out across the plains to meet his luck will never quite silence those pliant white bells of her petticoats ringing loose. Hmm. Inventing Anna. And of course the Anna's hummingbird is the hummingbird with the red throat, right? Right. So what so how so how did let's start with that poem. How how does how do you write a poem like that? Well, alas, that has an interesting story to it because when I wrote it, I had read something about uh, Anna's hummingbird, and um, but it turns out that what I had read isn't actually the story. <laughs> <laughs> and someone pointed that out to me about a year or two ago. Um, so it's really an entirely invented, inventing Anna. Um, but also, I read I've read a lot about uh, the the um, westward travels of the pioneers. Uh, I read a lot of the diaries of the uh, pioneer women. And, um, you know, it was just, it must have been heartbreaking to travel in these wagons and give birth and bury your, your child by the side of the road. And, you know, that happened so many times to so many women. And so... Uh, that was sort of at the heart of some of that poem also. Um, but you know, Bob, and I, li- I just want to say, I've always kind of liked June Night, and um, so I'm glad you like it. But you know, when I hear you read it, I think, did I write that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any real sense of having written it, you know. I don't know if that happens to other people who, if, does it happen to you when you write your poems? You write something, and then, you know, it's like, Huh? I can't believe I wrote that. I have no, you know... <laughs> kind of an out-of-body experience. Uh-huh, exactly. Well, and the opening lines, too. You know, we talk about um, you know, writing something that's challenging or difficult, and I got, you know, the moon dipping its fingers in ink, darkness sucking a star's hot thumb. I mean, two kind of out-there metaphors, right? What was that term you used? Outside the box. And then... Um, but then what you, what you end with is as though night had been given over to a crowd of wild girls it, it kind of roots it and then it's the kind of poem that you need to read a couple times to kind of figure out what's you know what's going on here what's the picture that you're painting I think that poem came out of standing on my front porch uh, and actually feeling sort of a sort of a palpable presence of these things converging um, but I do think that when we write our poems, uh, or at least I think the best of our poems come out of we're in a we're in a zone, we're in a different zone, and um, and the person sitting here talking to you isn't the same person who's in the zone writing poems. It's a different self, if you will, and um, uh, and for me it's the same with writing reviews. Uh, uh, or even in the old days in college, you know, my college essays, 
I look at them now and I say, huh, did, how did, did I write that? No, I didn't write that. Were they good? Um, the good ones. Okay. I, I, <laughs> and, and for the bad ones, I didn't write that. <laughs> So, so, but, but kind of being in a, in a different mindset, yes. being in a, in a zone, that's, yes. that's interesting. At least until you get the poem down. But then, uh, as I say to the people who have worked with me, then the, the shaper and maker comes into it, and that's the person who actually then does the work uh, of, you know, making sure it's the best words in the best order, pushing and, and t- you know, revising. The reviser is a different self also. And you spend a lot of time revising. I do. Yeah. 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 No, you know, not sometimes you get lucky. I don't think I revised um, uh, those two all that much. Uh, those two came fairly close to what what is there. But um, a lot of times I do come across old drafts of poems that are published or somewhere, and um, I forget where I started. Uh, you know, it's really interesting to look at um, the uh, the early drafts when I happen to find them. And then I think, wow, I completely forgot that's where I started. The Summer of Grand- the Grandmother's Poem, which is one of the first ones in that book, when I came upon the original draft of that, it had nothing to do with anything in that poem, mm-hmm. really. Uh, and um, so, oh, yeah, well... Let's hear it. yeah. I can just tell you that it started with magnolias. Uh, there might be magnolias in here. I don't I have to see. Um, but uh, anyway, summer of the grandmothers. They come back in their white shifts, their ruffled shawls of salt white, the way the dead always return when you need them the most, when it's too hot to do anything but picture the worst, the bomb finally fallen the world burned up, the entire planet radioactive. When you are too weak to do anything but lie in a stupor and call them back to drift at your side in eyelet dresses of old starlight, fresh-faced and cold. We're listening to Susan Kelly DeWitt and her poetry here at Coffee and Poets. And um, so what... uh, what projects are you working on now? What's uh, what directions are you taking? Oh boy, <laughs> I'm I'm kind of in a little. Um, well, I've been working on some prose-like poems for a while, but uh, you know, I'm I'm still sort of not sure where I'm going with those. Um, a few have been published, but um, I may end up with a manuscript of them. I'm not I'm not a hundred percent certain. And then, uh, you know, I have a couple of manuscripts that I'm. I've been working on for a long time. Uh, I'm also quite a mad reviser when it comes to manuscripts. Um, so uh, it's too bad the manuscript genie can't come down from the sky and just grab it from you and say, that's it, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> because until that happens, I keep you know, changing it. Uh, so it's mostly that, looking at, as I said, older uh, things and, um, uh, and seeing what can what actually might work, and uh, just trying to send a few things out. I'm teaching at the prison still uh, at Folsom again, oh. uh, and um, I'm still I'm teaching the painting, acrylic painting, for the women now at the Wisdom Project. So I'm taking the summer off from that, uh, but I'll start back again in September, and um, that's about it. Just life. Plenty, yeah, yeah plenty to right. do. Right, yeah, never yeah, a dull moment. Exactly. Yeah. You mentioned painting, and I'm wondering how that plays into your poetry, how you feel those two art forms intersect. Yeah, um, well, I grew up uh, in a defunct artist colony in uh, Hawaii, at at least my early childhood years. I've talked about this before. Um, I was in a very remote area, uh, uh, so I played out in nature, which has a lot to do with plants and bugs in my work, I think. Um, and also, I played down in um, what was their their uh, studio gallery. The um, the one of the painters was still alive. She was quite old at that point, um, eighty, 
and uh, her husband, who was also an artist, and they had founded this colony, had died, but their paintings were there, and I played among them, and some of them were very large, um, you know, paintings um, of uh, people and flowers and so forth. Um, so at some level, I think I interacted a lot with the paintings as my friends, uh, and um, so how does that translate into my poetry? Um, I think I use a lot of imagery, uh, m visual imagery uh, in my poems, so maybe in that way. Um, I, I've never been able to really do that much to bring them together, although in the show at uh, SPC, I had a show about six months ago or seven months ago now, um, and I, in the, the last year or two, I tried to actually incorporate words into my paintings a little bit, but I haven't been too successful with that. Process, though, um, uh, as I said, uh, the, um, the visual art process teaches you a lot about, number one, seeing, uh, paying attention, um, in a way, removing the distance between yourself and your subject, uh, entering your subject, and also the idea of the process and when you uh, how to surprise you know when you have to be alert for the fortunate accident it happens in poetry too, um, and uh, you know when you go too far or you don't go far enough, all those operatives uh, from visual art are are also uh, instructive for the poetry. So. Uh, Anyway, I don't know. So, well, and what do you mean by removing the distance between yourself and your subject? Well, this this is just my own take on it, but I've always felt as if uh, when you're writing a poem, you become your subject. You 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 enter your subject and and you fuse with it, and so that you're you're in it, you're inside it. Uh, so you're removing the distance, just as you would in. Um, you know, uh, the kind of uh, the old-fashioned contemplating the candle where, you know, you enter the candle, you become the candle. Um, and I think it's the same with painting. If I'm trying to paint this this glass in front of me with some water in it, which I will sip in a second, um, I'm really, you know, I have to sort of get into the glass uh, in, a, in some odd way in order to be able to paint it or write about it. And um, so it's, it's the idea of non-attachment in a way. Uh, you're not attached to yourself. You become part of the subject. You know, we do that as much as to the best of our ability and as much as we can, and it's never a perfect uh, process or formula, but that's at least what I, I aim for and what I believe is you know, happening for most artists and writers, but in my in my own little opinion, yeah. So it's a way of, uh, I mean, it's almost like really focusing your attention and just mm -hmm. giving your full attention to what it is you're, you're writing about, painting about, or or the person you're with, or whatever, just kind of right. a, um, a poem in here, and this is also in the Fortunate Islands, that just, you know, again, I, I think you're, there's this kind of the sense of this physicality and this image and, and staying with the image and being close to the image. And then out of that comes the spirituality and the understanding. You talked mm -hmm. about contemplating the candle, you become the candle. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to read this poem that I just uh, opened up, Egrets Along the Yolo Causeway, which I think does some of that. And I, I think a lot of your poems do that. There's kind of, a, it's kind of an amazing mm -hmm. fusion of physical, spiritual, or mystical and real at the same time. Egrets along the Yolo Causeway. Every day I watch how they float into the wind, how they stretch their legs out behind them like burnt matchsticks, then fall, heavy as drugged eyelids into muddy browns, crushed Irish, iris blues, how they plunge suddenly as danger or stupor into the shadows of a ditch. Often climbing up out of a shadowed place myself, out of a muggy, airless wetland where thoughts grow dark seeds like wild rice, I spot one, a loner, drifting below the causeway, 
wading the weedy edges of slough grass, his yellow beak gleaming like a cutlass, focused on the task at hand. Beauty is not even a vague idea to him, or truth. He'll stab whatever helps him live. Every day as I travel past them, from the prison where I teach men to uncage hope, snap open the hinges. I watch how they lift from the rich delta plowlands, how they glide free, a wholeness, like one white feather unlocked from its body, shiftless and holy. It's a pleasure to hear hear somebody read, you know, your poems. It's very nice. Thank you. Thank you. That almost gave me chills. I didn't. I wasn't sure where it was going. I had just seen a couple of of lines. Some of the lines. um, Mm. Oh, um, where thoughts grow dark seeds like wild rice. Right. Right, and that's a, there's a line break there, but dark, grow dark seeds like wild rice, I spot one, a loner. You got like nine single syllable words, and I'm always arguing with my students, they all use like big, long, fancy <laughs> words, and this is like, wow, these are good Anglo-Saxon, you know, <laughs> dark seeds like wild rice. <laughs> But, but it was beautiful to read it. It felt really good. Um, and maybe um, maybe you could talk a little... Two things. Uh, one is sound and, and what you look for with sound. In the other poem I read, too, there was stars and dark. I mean, you were, you were playing with vowel sounds. But, and then also line breaks. What, what are you doing? Are you, are you unsettling? Do you try and break... You know, create line breaks to kind of... Um, pull the reader or to resist the reader? What, what are your thoughts on, on those things? Um, well, uh, the, let me think, let me see, the, let me take the music first, um, or the, the, let me take the line break first. I always say to, um, in my workshops, think of the line as an organic unit of thought. So, and that really comes out of. Denise Levertov's theory of organic form, which I read many years ago and which was a seminal uh, essay um, for for uh, a couple of generations, it's that idea that uh, wherever the sentence goes, uh, it, it ends in the poem. You look for ways to build more layers of meaning into it by breaking the line in such a way that it has its own thought before you get to where the thought is really going. So you get all these organic units of thought, evocative, uh, I always say evocative units of thought, because um, you're trying to evoke uh, something, a, a lot of different things along the way to the main idea. And, uh, and then music enters into that also, um, you know, because sound is part of it. Um, so you're just playing with all those things, and uh, that poem, of course, has a little, it leaps across the page. Is it Tercet's? I think it is, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, the shape for me was part of it, obviously, because it's egrets uh, across the Yellow Causeway. So um, all those things were at play there. <clears throat> I read somewhere that that um, that uh, idea you were talking about that along the way to the end of the sentence that there's different meanings. I heard that described as partial meaning, I think, somewhere. And maybe it was Hirsch or um, X.J. Kennedy, one of those books. But so that, so that you think it means one thing, and then when you get to the end, it means something else. But because you thought it meant something else, right. it did, right? right. You, you, because yes, you exactly. had that thought. Right. So you're... you're um, you know, not that we get it, but uh, we're, we achieved this, but Emily Dickinson had a term called finite infinity. So that in a finite uh, piece of language on the page, you were trying to build in an infinite number of possibilities. And believe me, if you ex- explicate some of her poems with the uh, you know, Oxford English Dictionary, you see how many meanings for so many of the words, very different, but all of them would work in a single line. 
you know, and so you had, in a sense, finite infinity. Um, but uh, I think that's part of what you're after when you're, you're just trying to um, introduce surprise also. Surprise is an element, you know, you, you look at the line, how can you keep your reader off balance a little bit, surprise them before they get to the next line? or when they get to the next line, because they think the poem's going one way, and, oh, no, it's going a different way. But in the meantime, you have all these associations that the poem has evoked uh, in the reader, hopefully. Uh, so I think that's, that's part of it. And what does it say? No surprise for the reader? No surprise for the writer? Yeah, or? that was Frost. That was mm-hmm. Frost, yeah, okay, right. yeah. So you, you don't want it to be predictable. Exactly. Um, and that's probably the biggest... I think you know any any anyone who's an artist. We know that we we're, we're in it to discover something for ourselves, and when we discover it for ourselves, hopefully our reader discovers something also. Um, you know, you it's and sometimes the surprise can just be putting two words together that you didn't think of before that you didn't think could go together it doesn't have to be you know the world's greatest thought or wisdom uh, it, but um, and sometimes uh, you know you just surprise yourself with where the poem goes it's not that different from hearing novelists say that they write 150 pages and then a character comes in and that char- character takes over and it's not a character they expect, and they jettison the first 150 pages, and they go with this story that the, this character has to tell them, which they didn't know uh, was going to be told. And uh, so it's the same thing in a way in, in, a, in a poem. That the writing leads us to the idea. To the, yeah, exactly. To the surprise. Where, where, yeah. We're, where we're going. Or at least, again, there's, even if we somehow stay somewhat close to what we intended in a way, we're still surprised by uh, how, it, you know, how it comes about with the language we find in order to convey whatever it is we're conveying. Um, so I, again, I don't think it's an either or or any kind of formula. It's, each poem is a little different, but surprise is a key. Surprise. Yeah. Yes. Do you think you could throw away 150 pages? In a no- if I was writing a novel? Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I might... I might, uh, I might file them away and hope that I can figure out another use for them in 20 years. <laughs> All that time I wasted. And when you talk about, uh, when you talk about terms that, uh, you know, words that have never been put together, I mean, that's, I mean, that's what we want to get away from cliche. You know, right. I mean, the line, the moon dipping its fingers in ink, and I'm thinking, yeah, nobody, you know, no moon has ever done that before. <laughs> you know, or if we Google it, it, you know, you never probably know. not. Probably <laughs> you never not. know. <laughs> now, now you you know we, you mentioned Dickinson a couple times. Um, you know, other poets. Are, are there any poets that you just feel are kind of like your, you know, your overseeing umbrella that is you know, or the source, the the er Susan Kelly Dewitt. Um, well, I mean, I think there are a lot, but certainly Dickinson and Whitman are. Should be, I think, you know, for most of us, important at least historically. But they were important for me, um, and uh, uh, Elizabeth Bishop, Rilke. Um, th- this is early on when I Plath. Definitely when I first, uh, really first began thinking about writing, Plath was very big for me, um, and um, the Russian poets Akhmatova, um, Neruda. Um, uh, in our country, um, uh, more contemporary people. For me, a big uh, influence was James Wright, um, and um, Charles Wright to a lesser extent. Um, Jane Kenyon and um, Gwendolyn Brooks and Lucille Clifton, uh, and uh, so it's hard to choose. Oh, yeah. There's I no mean, one. I could make a very long... Well, but these are people that I spent a lot of time with, um, so I could make a very long list, uh, but I'm not going to remember all of them now, but yeah. But reading, you know, I mean, I think any writer will st- tell you that reading is more important than writing. Uh, when you, 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 I can hardly read 
half a page before I start to have a conversation with that writer and start to get some of my own ideas. I have to stop myself because, you know, if you want to finish what you're reading, <laughs> you can't stop every five minutes to write things. But um, but it all goes into you, you know, it goes into the well. And, um, and so I think, and even when you read people who you don't necessarily aren't your favorite uh, writers, you still learn a lot from doing that, and uh, you're filling the well. So... Um, I don't know how I got onto that. I forget the question. Well, that's okay. Well, no, I was I was asking about influences, and oh, and you yeah. do you write some prose, right? You write reviews for Poetry Flash, and um, so you read a lot of new poets, contempt people who are writing, you know, today publishing new books. Do you feel that writing about their work does that help your poetry, or is that just something you do to help out Poetry Flash, or? I think when I when I li- really like the books, uh, it definitely like any you know any reading. If you're reading something that you really uh, find terrific, it energizes you. Um, and uh, you know I I read Judy Halebsky's book, which is forthcoming at, this fall. Uh, she has her first book was Sky Equals Empty, and uh, it won the New Issues Prize. Her second book uh, is just fascinating and really. Um, uh, interested me a lot and energized me, I think. And then uh, recently I was reading, I'm going to write a review of Mary Mackey's uh, new book, uh, Travelers with No Ticket Home, which I loved her last book, Sugar Zone. Um, And this one is sort of uh, the same, you know, comes out of her travels to Brazil uh, also and uh, incorporates Portuguese. But it's just really, uh, it's such a good book. And... um, and I find, you know, again, whenever I read a book I really like, I, I st- it's like Emily Dickinson said, you know, the hairs on the back of your neck. St- I ha- I'm sitting usually, and I have a hard time staying sitting. I, I find I have to leap <laughs> up, really, because I just have so much energy from the writing, you know. And um, so it's fun when you review something, uh, you know, that you that you think highly of anyway. That's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Can you think of maybe one other poem you could read? We could close with a, with a piece of... I've got a couple of your books here, so... Oh, well, I'll just read the first poem in it. How's that? So, because this is kind of a failed guzzle. I was uh, going to write a guzzle, very formal uh, guzzle, and, um, and then uh, the last few couplets didn't work, so... Uh, but I kind of like this poem. Question mark cafe... I've been sipping coffee in the dark cafe, which is my today mind, uncurtained, stark cafe. The morning started crying for no apparent reason. The dreads were circling, shark cafe. How marooned I feel on this island of thought. I'm reviving like a half-dead verb in the word cafe. Name a word, any word. Soul could be the one you choose. Go ahead. It's okay in the last remarks, cafe. Who, if I cried, would hear me among the angelic orders? Rilke, the same old question mark, cafe. Today I'm that torn moth lipping the jack in the pulpit of history who fly away, ghost cafe. So you've been listening to Susan Kelly DeWitt reading her poetry here at the question mark cafe. I mean, Naked Lounge. (laughs) And uh, this is Coffee and Poets. I'm Bob Stanley. And uh, Lawrence Dinkins is our uh, moderator, I guess, uh, producer, director. He's he's running the show. And Susan, do you have any other... I just wanted to say thanks to Tim for asking me. Thanks to you for stepping in for this. And thanks to Lawrence for doing this and having me on the podcast. Thanks to the audience. (laughs) Thanks to all. (laughs) 